we went through a derivation where we found this very important formula for pressure in a fluid. And uh, the way we typically use it is we place point one at the top of the lake or whatever fluid you're dealing with. And uh, then we find the pressure at some depth, H, by plugging into our formula. Now, um, we found that that pressure at the surface, at the top of the lake, was not zero. That at the top of the lake, we were at the bottom of this vast sea of air, 30 kilometers deep, and that gave us this atmospheric pressure, uh, 101,325 Pascal. Now, this atmospheric pressure explains why I can pick up this chair with this piece of rubber. Okay, if I, if I put this rubber down on the chair, uh, the seal that's formed between the rubber and the chair doesn't allow any air to get in there. I still have 14.7 pounds per square inch pushing on this surface and pushing on that surface, holding those together. And it's not until I let some air in there that it uh, lets go. Now this explains why when you uh, get stuck in mud, you're walking along and you get stuck in mud and, and it's just hard to pull your, your foot free. It's just a little bit of mud. It shouldn't be that hard to pull your foot out of it. You're not fighting the mud. You're fighting 30 kilometers of air sitting on your head. Now normally as I walk across this floor, I have 30, uh, I have 14.7 pounds per square inch pushing down on the top of my shoe. But I also have air underneath my shoe. There's nooks and crannies down there. And that's pushing up on my shoe. And so it really doesn't affect me. But if I get into mud, that mud removes the air from the bottom of my shoe. No longer do I have those 14.7 pounds per square inch balancing the 14.7 pounds per square inch down. And suddenly my, my foot is glued to the ground and typically you end up losing a shoe, okay? Does that make sense what I'm talking about here? Now last day, we crushed a can with this, and I showed you a 55 gallon drum that was uh, crushed. Uh, I also have an example where a, a tanker is crushed. They steam cleaned this tanker out, tanker car, and then capped it off. Watch what happens. <laughs> Those crazy Germans. Now clearly this wasn't an accident. This wasn't something that someone got fired for. Those Germans are standing in the rain with their elbow. Uh, umbrellas waiting for this to happen. I mean, <laughs> it was planned. So the question has to be, why would you take a perfectly good uh, tanker and crush it like that, you know, just to entertain those, those people on the sidelines? Uh, there might be another explanation. Make a movie. Yeah. That's how it really happened. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Hollywood. Okay. Now, the first uh, demonstration of this uh, atmospheric pressure happened in Germany, in Magdeburg, uh, the university there. It was done by Professor Otto von it's a U-E together, that's a umlaut. Gürich. Anyway, uh, Professor Gürich took a, a couple of hemispheres, large hemispheres, and put them together with nothing but grease. And then evacuated the sphere, uh, pulled the air out, 
and hooked them to two teams of horses that were not able to pull these hemispheres uh, apart. Now, uh, this became a very famous uh, scientific picture. And uh, many years ago, when I was a teenager, uh, this picture was, was stolen and used for one of the most successful ad campaigns in the history of advertising. Anyone know what it was used for? What's that? Budweiser. No, not Budweiser. Most good commercials are for Budweiser, but not this one. This one was Levi Strauss. Uh, they had a pair of 501 jeans that replaced the, uh, the sphere, and these, these horses from uh, 100 years ago couldn't pull the jeans apart. Anyway, it became a very successful campaign, launched Levi Strauss, and now you're wearing Levi Strauss because of that picture. Okay, now we have here a Magdeburg sphere. Unfortunately, it is a very small sphere, meaning it doesn't have very many uh, square inches uh, on which the air is able to push. So we're not going to use two teams of horses. We're just going to use two horses. Thank you for volunteering. I appreciate it. Thank you for volunteering. Now, gentlemen, if you'll come up here. We're first of all going to pull the air out of there. Now, let me give you a, uh, a little bit of a warning. If you'll grab onto that. Don't pull yet. Um, Judging from the size of you, uh, both, there's a fairly good chance you're going to be able to pull these apart. Plan your life accordingly, <laughs> uh, especially you. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, so let me turn that off, and I'll turn that. Okay, gentlemen, go ahead. Okay, they did it. Let's give them a hand, folks. Okay, should have got smaller horses. <laughs> oh, okay. Now, you uh, just turned in a problem where you had to answer how deep do you have to go in a lake <coughs> of alcohol? The spring break problem. How deep do you have to go in a lake of alcohol to get the pressure up from one atmosphere to two atmospheres? Now, let's do it for water, and the process for, for your homework is exactly the same. We use this grand high equation for the pressure, where we set the pressure at the surface equal to one atmosphere, and if we want to increase the pressure by one atmosphere, we have to increase it up to two. And then we just uh, subtract one atmosphere from both sides, and solve for H. Now, if I want my H in meters, and I'm going to put in my gravitational field strength in newtons per kilogram, well, I better use MKS units for everything else. Now, the MKS units for one atmosphere is pascals, 101,325 pascals. I have to use the density of water in MKS units, kilograms per meter cubed. And that's because it's got to cancel with the newtons for each kilogram that uh, represents the 9.8. If I do that, I get a number. Anyone scuba dive? No one? What is this, Montana? Yes, sir. <laughs> OK, do you happen to know how deep you got to go to double the pressure up to two atmospheres? No idea. Okay. It's been a long time since I took my class, too. Ten meters. Ten meters. Okay. The fact that he said ten meters means that he knows how to do it right, and that means in the ocean with salt water. With fresh water, it is only 10.3 meters. It's a little less dense. But with salt water, it's exactly ten meters. And I gotta tell you, that's that's where scuba diving is worthwhile. 
I had a friend take me up to uh, Townsend uh, in the reservoir there, and we went scuba diving. And it was, you know, kind of fun to go scuba diving, but you're looking at mud and rocks. <laughs> and you think, oh man, this is boring. This is really boring. Now, um, let's talk about this homework problem that you voted off the island. Uh, the water table is down below where your house is, and so if you put a pipe down into the ground, and you put it down far enough that it reaches the water table, that water is not going to come rushing up that pipe. Uh, there's going to be air pressure, one atmosphere, pushing down on that water everywhere, including in the pipe. And so that water table is just going to stay there. Now if I take that pipe and hook it to a pump and evacuate it so that I have pressure equal zero, well that's going to take away this push. And now if you look at the push on the water table, it's pushing out here but not in there. And so that's going to push water up into the pipe, and that water is going to fill the pipe up until I get one atmosphere. Because I've got one atmosphere out here. Now we just found that that's going to happen if I've got zero uh, pressure here to get up to one atmosphere, that's going to take 10.3 meters. So that means that with a vacuum, you are able to pull water up a pipe. Mm, I misspoke. The vacuum's not pulling the water up the pipe. The vacuum's just allowing the air pressure outside to push the water up the pipe. But that pressure will only push it up the pipe 10.3 meters. And that's in Los Angeles, where they really have one atmosphere, because they're really under 30 kilometers of air. We have the good fortune to not live in Los Angeles. Every day, I thank my lucky stars for that. We are one mile high, which means we're not under 30 kilometers of air. So the pressure that we have here in Montana, in Bozeman in particular, is not quite one atmosphere. And so that means it's not going to push the water up quite 10.3 meters. It's going to it's going to come up less than 10.3 meters. Now, it turns out that even if it came up the full 10.3 meters, that doesn't help much. Most of us here in in, Monta in Bozeman, the water table I think for most of us is about 120 feet below our house. And so you're never you're never going to get the water to go up that high by sucking the air out of the top of the pipe. What you have to do to get water out of a well here is put the pump in the bottom of the pipe. And then, instead of pumping air, that pump pushes water. And then it grabs some more water and pushes it up behind and pushes up more water. And if you've got a strong enough pump, there's no limit to how high you can push the water up the tube. Now the problem with that is that when that pump breaks, it's going to cost you a fortune to replace. Because first of all, they got to get it out of the bottom of the well. Uh, it happened to me and it cost like uh, $2,000 to replace that pump um, out of the bottom of the well. Okay, questions on that homework problem? Does that make sense? Now suppose you happen to be wandering through the forest and you happen upon a pond of liquid mercury. How deep would you have to dive in a pond of liquid mercury before you increase the pressure from one atmosphere to two atmospheres? Does anyone know? It's a very famous number. Oh, oh yes, yes. 
700, actually, you're probably right for Bozeman. Uh, in Los Angeles, at sea level, it's 760 millimeters, or 0.76 meters, okay? Now, that's less than one meter. That's, uh, let's see, that deep. That's all you'd have to go, is that deep to double the pressure. And that's because liquid mercury has a density that's 13.6 times that of water. And so you have to go a distance, a depth, that's 13.6 shallower than you would have to go in water to double your pressure. Now, that's the way they used to make um, barometers. They used to take a long uh, tube, about a meter long, and fill it with liquid mercury. Then you put a pan there and you turn the whole thing upside down. Now, the column of liquid mercury is going to fall, but it can't fall all the way. Because as it falls, it leaves a vacuum here, and it only falls until the pressure here is equal to the pressure there, namely one atmosphere. And so that depth, if I'm going from zero atmospheres to one atmosphere, is going to be 760 millimeters of mercury, or 760 torr. Now, um, in truth, we don't have a perfect vacuum up here. The pressure is not exactly zero. There's some vapor pressure from the mercury that they have found is very, very dangerous. It causes brain damage. And that's why you have to be careful with liquid mercury. Now, when I was a child, my dad being a dentist, he used to bring home liquid mercury all the time. I mean, if they use it to make uh, fillings. And so while we were waiting for dinner, we'd be pushing these balls of liquid mercury around the table, and that's what we did for family fun. And <laughs> that explains my family. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I was, uh, I was teaching a class for future high school teachers at the University of Washington in their great big, big physics building, three-story huge building. And uh, we had the old school thermometers that had mercury in them instead of alcohol. And uh, one of the students dropped a uh, thermometer and sent liquid mercury all over. And, and next thing you know, I'm pushing it around the floor, you know, just playing with it. And uh, they evacuate the building. Everyone left the building. Next thing I know, people are coming in with space suits and I'm still playing with the liquid mercury. So it explains me too. Okay, let's get to the crux, crux of uh, Archimedes' principle. And I'm going to introduce this um, by going back to the island of Guam, where I went to high school. Right off the cliff from our house was the most beautiful beach on the island. And there was a little road that would wind down that cliff, and that's where we went every day after school. I imagine that I'm there often when you go into my office and I'm smiling. That's where I am. So suppose I go back there, and for whatever reason, I pick up a boulder. It's very heavy. And I'm walking across the sand. Oh, that's hot. Towards the water. And now I get into the water. That feels cool. That's nice. And as I go deeper in the water, it's up to my knees. I go deeper still, and suddenly I become stronger. As I go deeper in the water, the boulder is lighter because I am gaining strength. <laughs> what is happening? How is this water energizing me and giving me the strength to lift this boulder? The water's pushing up on the boulder. Yeah, the water's pushing up on the boulder. There's the water. That's what boulders look like in Guam. They're very regular. <laughs> but the deeper you go in the water, the bigger the push. That's what that equation was all about that we've been using. Now, if I take all the push from the water, I think you can see that the left is always going to cancel out the right. Okay? What's not going to cancel out is the upward push on the bottom and the downward push on the top. 
because the bottom of my, my boulder is always going to be deeper in the water, it's always going to have a bigger push. And so that means I can add up all of these pushes by the water, I can sum them all together into one force that always points towards the surface of the lake. We call it the buoyant force. Now, you'll notice that I don't put any subscripts on it, by the water, on the block, because the buoyant force is always by the water, on the block. You know, we just, we've already got a, a subscript buoyant, so I don't bother with the other. Now, here's the big question. How do I figure out how big that buoyant force is? And the person that answered this was Archimedes. Now I'm going to do this a little bit different than Archimedes did. I'm definitely going to use different language. But the idea is his. He was the genius that came up with this derivation of how big the buoyant force is. Now I'm going to take a boulder that's one meter by one meter by one meter. And I'm going to replace that boulder with a Casper box. Now you remember Casper the Friendly Ghost. How many of you watched that when you were kids? Okay, yeah, he was a friendly ghost. That's why we call him that. And uh, every now and again, in a scuffle that he had, he would accidentally swallow water. And you'd see that he'd be like a fishbowl and he'd have water inside him. So this box, made out of Casper material, holds stuff. But it doesn't have any mats. It's not a wooden box, it's not a metal box, it's a Casper box. It just holds stuff, mentally, okay? Now if I fill that box with water, there's gonna be a weight force associated with that Casper box filled with water. Now I know that the density of water in MKS units is 1,000 kilograms for each meter cubed. And by golly, my Casper box is one meter by one meter by one meter, one meter cubed. So there's a thousand kilograms of water in there. How much does it weigh in newtons? Not hard. Yeah, 10,000, just take M times G. 10,000 newtons. And here's where Archimedes' genius came in. He said, you know what, that water in the box doesn't know that it's special. It doesn't know it's different from the other water. And so that means that if I let the box go, it's not going to go up, it's not going to go down, it's going to stay right there. And that means that the buoyant force on that box has to be exactly 10,000 newtons. And then Archimedes went further and he said, I can put anything I want in that box. What if I put steel in that box? Well, if I put steel in that box, I'm going to have a much bigger force, weight force, than 10,000 newtons. Turn to Nimrod, your neighbor, and explain why that would be more than 10,000, and use the word density. Use the word density. Okay, I hope what you said to Nimrod was, steel's more dense than water, in fact it's 7.8 times as dense as water, and so that means the weight of the steel in that box is going to be 7.8 times greater than that of water, it's going to be 78,000 newtons. However, the buoyant force is caused by all the water surrounding the box. It doesn't care what's in the box. The water surrounding the box pushes the same regardless of what you put inside the box. And so that means the buoyant force is still going to be 10,000 newtons. And this box of steel is going to accelerate down to the bottom of the, of the lake. Okay? If instead we fill that box with styrofoam, the weight force is going to be less than 10,000. Why? because the density of styrofoam is less than that of water. But the buoyant force just doesn't care what's in the box. 
it's still 10,000. And that means this block of styrofoam is going to accelerate up towards the top and it's going to pop up out of the lake and float. Now, I, I love this, the far side. This one's a little dark. Uh, embedded in styrofoam shoes, Carl is sent to sleep with the humans. <laughs> Poor man. Okay. So, this is Archimedes' principle in a nutshell. The buoyant force acting on an object is equal to the weight of the fluid that's displaced by the object. Another way of thinking of that is the weight of the fluid that would fit in the Casper box. As a consequence, if an object has a greater density than that of water, it will sink in water. If it has a smaller density than that of water, it will float in water. And that's what you learned in the third grade. And it seems so simple. And yet I'm gonna show you a problem before the end of this uh, hour that is going to be just hard, way hard. And, uh, and you'll, I hope, come to respect these problems. Now, it turns out, if you are careful, you can float fresh water on salt water and you can float oil on fresh water. At University of Washington, we had a great big tall cylinder and we had five different liquids that were floating on each other, each one a different color, and we were careful not to bump it and it stayed that way for months. Now, if I have five objects and the density of each of those objects is given, and I carefully and slowly lower those objects into the cylinder and let go, where are they going to end up? Talk to Nimrod. Where are those five objects going to end up? Okay, this is not hard. A has a density less than oil, so it's going to float in oil. B has a density greater than that of oil, so it's going to sink in oil. But its density is less than that of water, so it's going to float on water. C has a density that's greater than water, but less than salt water. It's going to sink in the fresh water, float on the salt water. D and E both have densities that are greater than that of salt water, so they end up at the bottom. Now, the point I want to make is that things either sink to the bottom or float at the top. They don't end up here. The only way they can end up here is if they have exactly the same density as the liquid, and that's hard to engineer. If something has exactly the density of salt water, I could put it anywhere I want and it would stay because it acts like salt water. But again, that's hard to engineer. In real life, things are either at the top of the lake or the bottom of the lake. But what about Jaws, Greg? What about... Na -na, na -na, na -na, na -na, na -na. You remember that movie? Oh, you're too young. Scariest movie ever made, and it came out while I was living on Guam, going into the ocean every day. When we were out there snorkeling, all my friends had to do was just every now and again to just na 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 na. -na. That was when the shark was coming. And the scariest part of that movie, by far, was when the the sheriff goes down at night with a flashlight, a waterproof flashlight, and he's looking around for the body, but he doesn't find the body. He just finds. <laughs> and he turns around, no, 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 there's the body. And it's not at the bottom, it's not at the top, it's right there in front of him, kind of floating halfway. Did Hollywood get it wrong? Sometimes they do. <laughs> but in this case, I think they didn't. In this case, they were, they were using the fact that in a, in a real body of water, there is a temperature gradient. You've experienced this if you've dived into a pond off of a, a dock. 
you know that the first foot and a half is really warm. The sun has warmed it up. And then it's like you go through this invisible barrier, this invisible boundary, and suddenly it's very cold. And, and these temperature differences, these boundaries, set up essentially layers of different density. And that body could be floating on one layer and sunk in another layer, like that block right there. Now in this class, we're going to ignore the temperature gradient, the temperature difference in our liquids, and just always assume that it's all the same temperature. Okay, I just didn't want you to watch movies and say, oh, you know, they got the physics wrong. They sometimes do. You know, Lois Lane falling and, and Superman scoops her up. Should have been so much better if she just hit the concrete. He is changing her momentum so drastically, she's just mush. So some of the movies are wrong. Okay. Now, that ship. You understand Archimedes' principle. We just talked about it. That a sinker or a floater? Made out of steel. A sinker or a floater? Yeah, Lloyd's of London would like to classify that as a floater. And that's why they insure it. But our definition suggests that it should be a sinker. So let me give you an operational definition for sinking and floating. You take a giant, the giant grabs the ship, the giant drags it down to the bottom of the ocean, and the giant turns it over and over and over until all the air bubbles come out. Then the giant lets go of it. If it goes up, it's a floater. If it stays down, it's a sinker. And with that operational definition, that's a sinker. Its density is greater than that of the water. Okay? On the internet, they had some pictures of a boat that came up against a bridge, and someone forgot to raise the bridge, and so it just kind of crashed up next to the bridge and went under. But this is a good boat. <laughs> it just came up the other side. That's a, that's a floater. <laughs> yeah, it keeps on coming up. Okay, question with your clicker. The buoyant force is greatest on a 10-ton ship if it is floating in fresh water, salt water, liquid mercury, all the same. diagram. I've got the weight down and the weight on a 10-ton ship is coincidentally 10 tons. That's why we call it a 10-ton ship. The only other force acting on it is the buoyant force up. And what's the acceleration of a ship that's floating? Zero. Zero. And that means that these two forces have to be equal and opposite by what law? By second law with zero acceleration. And that means that that buoyant force has to be 10 tons, whatever it's floating in. So what is different between floating in fresh water and liquid mercury? Yeah, how it floats, how low it floats. If I'm floating in fresh water, that boat, in order to float, has to have a buoyant force equal to 10 tons. That means it has to ride low in the water, low enough to displace 10 tons of water. But if I'm in a lake of liquid mercury, heaven forbid, that'll be green, I still have to displace 10 tons of liquid mercury. But it has a very high density, and so that means I don't have to displace a very big volume to get my 10 tons. 
So that, uh, that boat's going to ride very high. It might not even be stable. It might just fall over in a uh, lake of liquid mercury. But why was it floating in a lake of liquid mercury to begin with? That's silly. So where are these people? They are at uh, the Dead Sea, actually. That's what the intertube said. They could also be at Great Salt Lake. The Great Salt Lake has the same density as the Dead Sea. And if you go out there, you float very high, and uh, you feel very grungy when you're done. OK. I have here three blocks that are identical in the sense that they are all the same size, and they are all painted black. But this one is made of steel. And this one is made of aluminum, and this one is made of wood. On which of those three blocks is the buoyant force the greatest? Talk to Nimrod. On which of those blocks is the buoyant force the greatest? The answer is not the wood, okay? Both of the metal cubes, where they are, water used to be. They are displacing the amount of water equal to their full volume. The wood, on the other hand, is floating with half of its volume above, half below the surface. That means only half of its volume is displacing water. Whatever buoyant force we have on the aluminum block, we only have half as much buoyant force on the wooden block. It floats because it's so much lighter. And indeed, we know that whatever the buoyant force is on the wooden block is equal to the weight of the wooden block. Okay? Now, I just gave you the answer to the next question, so we should get this all correct. Which block experiences the larger buoyant force, A, B, or both the same? Again, I just gave you the answer. If ever there was a chance to get 100%, this is it. Don't let me down. Okay. Oh, dear. These 12 people are just thinking about something else. Yeah, okay. Regardless of whether something sinks or floats, the buoyant force is going to be equal to the weight of the liquid displaced. This one is displacing much more liquid than this one, and so it has a much greater buoyant force. By Newton's second law, if they are floating, that buoyant force also has to be equal to the weight of the object. That means that these two blocks cannot be made out of the same kind of wood. The density has to be different for the two. Okay? Uh, this has to be a dense wood like oak. This has to be a less dense wood like balsa wood. Now, indeed, by looking at how it floats in the water, I can tell you what its density is. If this is floating with 80% of its volume submerged, it's got a density that's 80% out of, of the water. I'll show you that in just a moment. This one is floating with only about 20% of its volume submerged, so it has a density of about 20% that of water. Now, what should I remember? What should I take away from this lecture? Well, there's only two things. Archimedes' principle always applies, always, whether it's floating at the top or sunk at the bottom. The buoyant force will always, always, always be the weight of the fluid displaced. No exceptions. No exceptions. If the object is floating, you get a second tool in your toolbox. And that is, there's only two forces, 
buoyant up, weight down, and it's got no acceleration. So that means that the buoyant force also has to equal the weight of the object. The 10 ton ship, if it's floating, has a buoyant force equal to 10 tons. Okay? Check with Nimrod. See if Nimrod is on the bus with this. Okay. I promised you a really hard problem or two. Remember, I just told you that if something like an iceberg is... If you can only see 10% of the iceberg, that means you can't see 90%. What I just told you was that that meant that the density of the ice is 90% the density of the liquid. Well, let me prove that. If I have a block of wood, 20 centimeters on a square, and I put it in water, suppose that it floats with 70% submerged, 14 centimeters, and 30% uh, on top. If what I say is true, this block of wood should have a density that's 70% that of water. Well, let's see. If I draw a free body diagram for that block, I have the weight down, I have the buoyant force up. And they had better balance because they're the only two forces and there's no acceleration. So the weight down is just the mass times g, gravity, and I can replace the mass with the density of the wood, the block, times the volume of the block. The density is how many grams I have in one unit of volume, and then I multiply that by the number of units of volume. Now, the buoyant force, on the other hand, is equal to the weight of the fluid in the Casper box. Well, what's the Casper box? Well, the whole block's not displacing water, just that part, okay, the part that's submerged, and that's the Casper box. Now, the weight of that water is the mass of the water times g, and the mass of the water is equal to the density of the water times the volume of the water that's been displaced, the volume of the Casper box. So now I have those two forces, and I set them equal to each other. I can cancel the G, it's on both sides, and now remember what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to find the density of the block as a fraction of the density of water. So I divide both sides by the density of the volume of the block, and I get this. The density of the block is equal to the density of water times this fraction. This fraction is the volume submerged divided by the total volume of the block. It's the percent of that block which is submerged. In this case, 70% is submerged, so the density of the block should be 70% of the density of water, and that's what I get. 700 kilograms per meter cube. Now that derivation is not going to be on an exam. You'll never have to reproduce it. But I just wanted to show you where my prediction was coming from. We have two minutes. Let me give you this difficult question. You're floating in a boat in your very own swimming pool. You're rich. And in the boat with you are six bars of gold. You are very rich. You reach outside the boat with a marker and you mark the level of the water on the side of the pool. And then you, one at a time, take the bricks of gold and drop them into the pool. They go down to the bottom of the pool. Does the water in the pool go up above that mark you made with the marker? Does it go down below or does it stay the same with your clicker? Tell me what it does.
Okay, has everyone voted? Okay, excellent. Ten of you got that right. Ten of you. The water level goes down. We'll talk about it on Friday. Have a good day.